As we approach Easter, we are looking at Jonah this morning. So we're going to cover the four chapters of Jonah. Jonah is a prophet. The book of Jonah is in the Old Testament. Uh, it's on page 1210 in my Bible, uh, you know, if that, if that helps at all. Jonah. A lot of us are familiar with the story of Jonah. And Jesus makes a reference to a ad- violent, hostile, adulterous generation asking and demanding a sign from him that the only sign that they would receive would be the sign of Jonah. And so we're going to cover four chapters. I'm not going to be able to read the four chapters. We've been reading the four chapters, one chapter a day for the last four days, if you've been getting the emails. I don't even have a sermon in the sentence for Jonah. What I have is quoting Jesus from Matthew chapter, 10, uh, Matthew chapter 12. And so my sermon in the sentence where we start is Matthew chapter 12. 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39 through 40, says this. Jesus said to the self-righteous leaders, quoting, But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves a sign. And so no sign will be given to you except the sign of Jonah, the prophet. For just as Jonah was in the stomach of the sea monster for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. So we start with Jesus making this reference in Matthew chapter 12. He not only makes a reference to the sign of Jonah, but he also explains it. It's about three days under, and then above. So it's about Jesus' death and resurrection. Too many of us look at Jonah as we saw it as children in Sunday school, and we don't get any deeper other than Jonah misbehaving, getting swallowed, getting spit up, and for some reason having a problem with a plant and a worm. And when I was studying Jonah for this morning, I realized that in a lot of ways, Jonah symbolizes, is a type of, is foreshadowing Jesus. All his good qualities are about Jesus. And then it occurred to me that all of Jonah's bad qualities are about me. So Jonah is simultaneously a good example to us, like Jesus, and calls us on our own garbage. So let me go through these four chapters of Jonah, realizing it's about Jesus and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection, Jesus saving us from the wrath of God and realizing that Jonah is also about us, and we can relate to Jonah. And the book of Jonah starts off with it being about you and me, because Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, is about Jonah's rebellion. Jonah is given instructions by God, and Jonah, the prophet of God, says, no thank you. He actually turns God down, thank you for your opinion, I'm not on board, and then does the opposite. Now who can relate to that, right? That's my struggle. That's your struggle. God whispers us to do the smallest thing, and we wish he had shouted it at somebody else, right? So the rebellious Jonah is so real and is so you and me. God tells Jonah to take a message of repentance to the city of Nineveh, to go north by land. You're supposed to travel north by land to Nineveh, preach the gospel, rescue them. And Jonah chapter 1 verse 3 tells us exactly what Jonah did. 
Jonah, chapter 1, verse 3 says, But Jonah got up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord, like you could run from God. But who's been guilty of thinking? Oh, God's not seeing this. Or if I lay down long enough, this feeling will go away. Oh, <laughs> right? It's us. We're Jonah. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship that was going to Tarshish, which is Spain, paid the fare, boarded it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. Oh my. So, instead of a land journey north, he gets on a boat to go west, trying to do the... Jonah's story is one of the worst possible fishing trip you could go on. Where you go from dangling the worm on the hook to being the worm on the hook. It's the worst cruise ship experience because you've paid your fare, you're heading to a nice sunny destination, and then the weather causes chaos and trouble and everything goes wrong here. Jonah a prophet of the Lord trying to run from the presence of God. You've got to appreciate that. Jonah is a prophet. He's been called to task by God. Go prophesy to this people in this place. And Jonah says no. That's you and me, my friends. Because you are not a prophet of the Lord, but God has appointed you the divine purpose to be God's ambassador. You carry the flag of the kingdom of God. You bring the light of the Lord into the darkness. And you're supposed to take the message you have received from God and deliver it where you're supposed to go. And yet we lay down until that feeling goes away. We distract ourselves with 15 shiny things, figuring if we don't do it, God will pick somebody else. We're, we're Jonah. And the vast majority of us are aboard a ship heading to nowhere, going right into the hurricane, and wondering why everything is going crazy. Because Jonah received instructions from the boss. He was told to go one direction and do one thing, and he took off running the other way. And we are told to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost, and we say no. I know we don't actually say no. We're too clever for that. We use fancy words like evangelists are supposed to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. Or missionaries. It's missionaries' jobs to take the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. We pass the buck saying it's somebody else's job rather than realizing you are who you are. You are living where you're living. You are employed where you are employed. Your circle of friends and influences are your circle of friends and influences because God wants to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ into the lives of those around you. We've been appointed to be God's ambassador, and he's got us here with these people to do it. And yet, no thank you. And then we wonder why the world is so dark, and the country is going to hell in a handbasket. We blame God for that when it's really our fault. We do the bad rebellion. Jesus, uh, Jonah, ooh, I'm tra tra swapping out my J's, ain't I? That's the first time I did it, isn't it? That's the, okay, because it's going to happen 15 more times. Just keep counting how many. Uh, Jesus, Jonah, John, we're going to mix all them up, aren't we? Yeah. All right. Jonah went west by sea as an absolute rebellion, trying to get away from God. And we ignore the lost around us. Completely ignore them, waiting for somebody else to do that job. We're Jonah, my friends. The first 14 verses of Jonah, I can totally relate to. 
And I know you can as well. That's not really the sign of Jonah, though. The sign of Jonah is how the chapter ends. So when you get to Jonah chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, Jonah chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, the, the image shifts. Jonah is no longer you and me. Jonah is now like Jesus. Jonah is like Jesus. This is the symbolic death for three days that Jesus made a reference to in Matthew. A storm hits. Jesus, uh, I did it again. There's two. Jonah's on the boat. A hurricane hits. These seasoned sailors who have spent their life on water are freaked out. They do something no cargo ship does, and that is they throw the cargo overboard. They're selling out the profits and wages, being able to pay their bills for months, trying to survive this hurricane storm. They pray to all possible gods they can, trying to figure out what is going on, praying for any god in the world to come save them from this storm. And what do they do? They find that jo Jonah... I almost did it there again. Jonah was napping. Jonah is napping on the boat during the storm, just like Jesus. Jonah, at this, is like Jesus. And so, the sailors go to Jonah and is like, hey, pray to your God, because maybe your God will be the one that rescues us. Then they decide this has to be somebody's fault. Haven't you had storms in your life where you wondered whose fault it was? Yeah. And it's always their fault. Yeah. They cast lots. They roll the dice. And it reveals that it's Jonah's fault. Jonah's the one causing the storm. So in Jonah chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, it says this, my friends. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea. They ejected him off the boat mid-cruise. Your bad luck for the fishing, overboard you go. And the sea stopped raging. He hits the water, the storm ends. Then the men became exceedingly afraid of the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows, because they had seen the hand of God work. And the Lord designated a giant fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights in a belly of a fish underwater is Jesus' reference to death. Jonah's under the water for three days. Jesus' body will be in the ground for three days. So this is symbolic death for Jesus. That's the reference Jesus is making. I'm so proud of the sailors in the story. Because, I mean, here these sailors respond in a very positive way. The sailors were afraid. And instead of being swallowed by their fear, they end up sacrificing and vowing to God. And the lost around us, the lost people who are without the grace, mercy, and love of God around us, they are consumed by fear. Anxiety and phobias eat them alive. And so they search for the unknown. They end up doing weird sacrifices instead of true sacrifices. They make false vows to false gods. They completely mess it up in their search. When all along, you and I have been placed there to be the lifeguard for them. To point them in the right direction. And how beautiful is it, in the midst of all of this situation, when Jonah hits the water, God works. The storm stops, and a giant fish, or a sea monster, as Matthew puts it, swallows Jesus up. I, I did it again. That's three. Swallowed Jonah up. 
Jonah, Jesus, John. There's too many J's. I knew I was going to do that. I had to be more careful. That's three. One for each of the Trinity. No, now I'm making it worse. No. Three days and three nights. Jonah is in the fish's stomach for three days and three nights. That's the sign of Jonah that Jesus refers to because it's about Jesus' death and burial in the ground for three days and three nights. We are approaching Holy Week, Passion Week. Today is Palm Sunday when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem prepared for his death for us, his burial and his resurrection. And so this is all a connection to Jesus dying on the cross for you and I so that the guilty can have their sins forgiven. His body is put in the tomb. And three days later, the ladies come to to take care of the body, to put incense and fragrance and potpourri on it, and find the tomb empty. Three days, the sign of Jonah. It's about death. Death. And when I think about Jonah's symbolism of death in the fish's belly, and Jesus' physical, historical, real death and burial in the tomb for three days, I immediately think about me and Jesus' command to us about dying to self. We fear God. We are supposed to make self-sacrifices, sacrificing ourselves. Make no vows so that our yes is yes, our no is no. And we are called by Jesus to die to self. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. That's our call. And that's where we fail, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because we aren't denying ourselves, but we're the sum of the most selfish people that we know. We don't sacrifice ourselves. We're holding on for dear life, thinking everything is about us. And then we think that following Jesus has something to do with showing up for an hour on Sunday or having our, roles, our name on the roll somewhere. And it's not. We need to fear God. Deny ourselves. Die to ourselves. And passionately follow Him. Jonah's symbolic death. But he doesn't stay in the fish. No. Chapter 2. Man. <laughs> Jonah's attitude is radically changed by this experience. You just knew it, right? I mean, if you've ever had a traumatic experience, your attitude changes. Sometimes it gets worse. Sometimes it gets better. Jonah is a great example of it getting better because he's got some time in this belly of the fish. There's no cell service. There's no YouTube, right? There's no Netflix. There's not even anybody to talk to. There's no light. You're just, you're in there. You know, the miracle of a bubble of air for you to breathe and the miracle of stomach acid not eating you alive. You're just alone with the bare minimal. So Jonah chapter 2, Jonah prays. He prays in the belly of the fish and his prayer is, it's powerful. It's, it's confessional about his own sin. It magnifies the glory of the Lord, it is a beautiful, beautiful thing. It reminds me of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane with the sleeping followers. And he's praying for his disciples. He's praying for the coming church. He's praying about the cup of suffering he's about to endure. Jonah is like Jesus in Jonah chapter 2. I got him all right that time. Just saying. All right. Nailed it that time. I didn't, I didn't do that wrong once. When you get to the end of chapter 2 and the prayer of Jonah has been heard by God, Jonah chapter 2 verse 10 has got the action. Jonah chapter 2 verse 10 says, Then the Lord commanded the fish 
and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. You don't get to read the word vomit very much in the Bible. <laughs> right? I mean, okay then. Good deal. Yeah, I... Here you have prayer in the midst of trouble and coming up out of the water, out of the fish, coming up out of the grave. There's so much here. I like how God is absolutely in command of the timing of this. And it's a good thing he was near land or Jonah would have drowned. It all kind of worked out, right? You think you've had a bad fish experience. Oh, but isn't that beautiful? Here we have prayer in trouble. In the stomach, Jonah prayed. Why do we only pray when we are in trouble? Has it gotten so bad now that we need to pray about it? Instead of living what Scripture tells us, God's Word tells us to pray without ceasing. To have a lifestyle of communal, communal, continual communication with God. To be continually talking and listening to God so that it's, it defines your lifestyle. Pray without ceasing. It has no commercial breaks in it at all. That's a holistic lifestyle of praying and listening. And when you're communicating with God as a lifestyle, you tend to not miss moments of great intercession for others. You don't miss opportunities where you should be praying about something before you do it. And then when you get in trouble, you're very close, mid-conversation with them already, so it's easy to say, Lord, help me. We aren't good about communication with God at all. We aren't. And our relationship suffers from it. And maybe that's why we get brutalized so much in life. It's, uh, it's spankings and groundings from our Heavenly Father to start living right, being the obedient child of God instead of the rebellious, egotistical, self-centered, rebellious child of God that we are. I used the word rebellious twice, and I meant it, right? How beautiful is it that the fish vomits Jonah out? and vom vomits Jonah out on dry land. And this is the symbol of resurrection. So Jonah's under the ground for, th Jonah's under the water for three days, is vomited out onto dry ground. Jesus, is, his body is buried in the tomb for three days. And then he is raised from the grave so that when they come looking for him, they find his body gone. The burial shroud is folded neatly because Jesus is a firstborn. So he knows to, you know, he knows to, you don't leave the mess. Only firstborns get that. I'm sorry. Ask a firstborn, they'll explain it to you. First. He's raised. He's raised from the dead. Jesus died for our sins on Good Friday to make it possible for you and I to have an intimate, passionate relationship with God. He was dead and buried for three days. And on Easter morning, on Resurrection Sunday, the tomb is empty. Luke chapter 24, verse 5. You're looking for the living among the dead. Why are you looking in the tombs in the cemetery for Jesus? He's up and about. Jesus is alive, and the tomb is empty. And that's the message of Jonah and the sign of Jonah. Resurrection. Praise the Lord for that. 
If you put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus Christ, you are living in the new life, the resurrection power that is offered you. New life in Jesus. We don't walk in the midst of that new life as much as we should, my friends. Where we die to the old selves, the old man is gone. We're a new person. We die to our old lifestyles because we're living a new lifestyle in Jesus. We die to our old ways and we are resurrected in victorious power to be a new person, new identity, new life, new methods, manners, new purpose, new goals. It's the ultimate transformation. New life in Jesus Christ. You go from sinner to saint, an enemy of God to a child of God. You get transferred from a kingdom of darkness to a kingdom of light. And then we start living a resurrected lifestyle 365, 24-7. Light in the midst of the darkness, my friend. It's a powerful idea. Jonah didn't go back in the water. You think maybe he had a little hydrophobia after that? You know? You think, you know, when mom served up fish, he went, no thank you. You know? I mean, just wonder if it's, you know, how traumatized he was about that. I, I think very much so. Left the old behind, and he charged forward in the new. And so must you and I, my friends. So must you and I. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. Now we have Jonah being like Jesus. Here we have Jonah's salvation message. Ten verses in Jonah chapter 3 following Jesus' example. I know this sermon doesn't have a sermon in the sentence. I'm sorry about that. It was really long-winded out of Matthew. But Jonah's sermon is only eight words. Jonah's sermon is eight words. All he says around Nineveh is, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Jonah chapter 3, verse 4. Not the evangelistic Billy Graham call to repentance and action that you would expect. He doesn't even mention God. All he says is 40 days and the city's going to be overthrown. That, he doesn't, that, that's it. That's all the details we get. And we know what happens. The message gets spread around Nineveh so that the king of Nineveh hears of it. And with no other instructions other than, yet 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown, the king calls for citywide repentance. We're going to fast for 40 days. No eating, no drinking, no Netflix. For 40 days, we're going to wrap ourselves in sackcloth and ashes so that it makes us itchy and uncomfortable. We're not even going to let our pets eat or drink. I'm not sure if you can get sackcloth on a cat. I think a dog might be a little compliant. I think the cats would go, there'd be some kind of cat world war. And I'm pretty sure if you denied your dog food for 40 days, your dog would still love you and worship you. A wonderful example to us and our relationship to God. I think after 40 days, the cats would eat you in your sleep. So I don't know. We probably should deal with that separately. Just, this is how my mind works. The king calls for state-sponsored repentance. And the people repent. Yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Eight words. I will not learn that as a lesson for preaching. You hear that in Jesus as well. Jesus and John the baptizer. Jesus and John the baptizer shared a nine-word sermon. Matthew chapter 3 verse 2 has a nine-word sermon by 
Jesus and his cousin John the baptizer. His sermon is, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's a clearer instruction. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And when we hear that, we often think it's for somebody else. And rarely do we fast for 40 days. Make our pets, our livestock, fast for 40 days. Pass that message on to others so they know they should repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We just ignore it and move on. And yet, both of these sermons, Jonah's eight-word sermon, Jesus and John's nine-word sermon, has an urgent invitation. It's an urgent invitation to respond to it. You've been warned. What are you going to do about it? John the baptizer's audience, some responded. Jesus' audience, some responded. All of Jonah's audience responded. We are given this invitation by a holy God who loves us, accepts us, wants to forgive us, wants to protect us from our own self-destruction. And we won't repent. We don't want to be saved because we enjoy the warm water. They may be drowning, but I'll survive. And so we wallow in our sin, evil, and wickedness. No thank you. We wallow in our sin, evil, and wickedness that we are good at. Thinking that later, later, I will repent. After I have my time of enjoyment. Not realizing that we don't know when the 40-day limit is up. And then, of course, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand gives us a very interesting time frame. And the interesting time frame is now. So, brothers and sisters, whether you have put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus Christ, and you've been walking with Jesus for a day or a decade, or whether you've never put your faith, your belief, your trust in Jesus, we need to acknowledge that we are sinners, evil and wicked, in our lifestyles, the decisions we make, the actions we take, the way we talk, the way we think. And we need to confess our sin and forsake our sin, leaving it behind us, shedding the old or the new, and receiving the salvation in grace and mercy that Jesus is offering us. Be saved or be overthrown. Be saved. Or be overthrown. And when you get overthrown, be mature enough to realize you did it to yourself. You rejected the lifeguard and the life preserver. And you drowned because you wanted to drown. Jonah. Jesus. John the baptizer. Will you repent and be saved from being overthrown? Something we need to ponder, my friends. Chapter 4 is the weird chapter. Really, chapter 3, ending Jonah, makes sense. Jonah is writing this historical account about himself, and he's being mean to himself, so you've got to appreciate that level of honesty. But chapter 4 takes a weird turn. This is like a sequel that shouldn't happen, you know. <clears throat> it's like, oh, bad. Jonah, Jonah leaves Nineveh. Nineveh has repented. 
God's wrath has not fallen. Praise God for revival happening in Nineveh. And Jonah is pouty. He's angry. And so Jonah is us, right? This is what we do. Um, We get angry, we get pouty when things don't go our way. Even when we tell God what we want him to do and he does not do it, we get angry and pouty. Let's be honest, you and I are far more often the toddler at Walmart in the candy aisle laying on the ground screaming at the top of our lungs while mom and dad goes, whose child is this? I know you think you're the parent, but you're really the, right? That's us. And here, Jonah, bless his heart, being honest about himself. In Jonah chapter 4, he's out in the desert, mad at God. So God grows a plant to provide him shade. And he basks in the shade in this desert. And then the next day, a worm comes along and eats the plant and the plant dies. And Jonah, in his pouty, angry, toddler throwing a temper tantrum on the candy aisle, throws a temper tantrum to God, and God calls him on it. Beautiful. In the midst of this, Jonah, in talking to God, will talk about God's character. It'll describe God as being gracious, compassionate, slow to anger, full of loving kindness and relenting. It's pretty much the same description that God gives Moses in Exodus 34 with the uh, 13 mercies of God. 13 mercies of God. And yet even in the midst of proclaiming God's Mercy and compassion, Jonah is pouting and angry. And I can totally relate to that, right? God is good, but you're not being good to me right now. God is Lord, but this is my will, and I want you to do it, God. God, I know all things in your timing, but I'm on a timetable and you're not meeting it. We're guilty of this. Yes, yes, yes. And because we are distracted by the candy we are not getting, we miss God's work. And God calls Jonah on this. Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. God reaches out to Jonah, throwing this pity party, and says, Jonah, you care more about this plant that existed for one day providing you shade than you do for the 120,000 souls who have been saved in Nineveh. Ouch. Right? Ouch. No wonder the book of Jonah ends on that statement. I mean, what's Jonah supposed to write after that? He can't write because his bottom's sore from being spanked by God. That's what it is. He's, he's, you know, uh, Jonah. Ah! We see in Jonah, J- chapter 4, selfishness and a call for repentance. His reaction prompts a reflection on our attitudes. Because you and I are selfish like Jonah. You and I pout. We get angry. We get suicidal. All when things are not going our way. And we refuse to hear the word of the Lord that God's character is pure. And God's work is powerful. And we need to get off the floor. Wipe the snot off our noses. And start following the instructions of our Heavenly Father. And be obedient children. We're Jonah. My friends, will you repent from being too much like the spoiled, rotten brat of Jonah, and instead celebrate, celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus, the forgiveness 
compassion and grace that you have received. And the fact that you are walking with him every moment of every day. He has taken away the old and has made us new, my friends. Let's start behaving like grateful children of God instead of the way we mostly behave.